thank you all for having me here. Uh, you just heard a little bit of um, my bio. I'm, people usually think of me or use the word success to describe me. Uh, but the truth of that, as I'm standing here and I'm feeling very nervous and I'm feeling like an imposter on the stage and that I really shouldn't be here, is that I, I don't feel like that inside. Um, the truth is I wasn't always successful. In fact, it was quite different. Um, when I was young, my parents actually thought that there was something a little off about me. I didn't start speaking until the age of three. They took me to doctors, as parents would do, and the doctors at that time, this is 38 years ago, said I was a little slow. That was the word they used. My parents dismissed it. I was a girl, after all, and they could someday hope to get me married. When I was about four or five, we moved countries, and I ended up in a new school, an international school, and it was my teachers then who noticed that something wasn't quite okay with me. I wasn't quite up to the standard of other children. I was put into uh, English as a second language class, which was ironic because English is the only language I can speak, the only language I could speak then, the only language I can speak now fluently. I remember a lot of parent-teacher conferences, a lot of worry and anxiety from my parents. I also remember the reasons that all of this was the case. I would, I wouldn't put the right shoe on the right foot. I couldn't tell left from right. I would get lost all the time. I couldn't follow directions. I was very clumsy. I dropped things. I spilled things. I did this so often that I left my mother in a constant state of exasperation and worry about me. There were times I would arrive at school and I would feel terribly embarrassed because I realized I had forgotten to put on my underwear and I was humiliated when my classmates found out about this. I had problems running and in PE classes. My classmates called me slow coach. Again, when we moved and I was in a new school, I started wearing glasses and no one wanted to be my friend. No one wanted, because I was so ro slow at running and I couldn't quite move like everybody else. Um, they, no one would put me, pick me for their team. And everywhere would wake up with this horrible feeling of dread of going to the school where I was alone and I had no friends. Um, there were other issues. Uh, in class, I struggled to pay attention. My teachers would constantly scold me. I was failing subjects. And I was so worried about how my parents would react because like many Indian parents, they wanted me to do really well and come first in class. I feel like many people have that. Uh, I wouldn't show them my report cards where I was failing. In fact, I would forge my father's signature on my report cards. And then, of course, I got punished and everyone thought that my teachers and my parents thought that more discipline and punish would like get me somehow fix things, but it didn't. And instead, I would dream of running away. I had no friends, so I would start eating, and I, at some point, became overweight, and that made things even worse. But when I was a child, I had a coping strategy. I read and I disappeared into books and into the characters I found in those books. They became my friends that I didn't have in real life. I made up rituals inside me where I could express myself. And one night, after a really, really bad report card, I remember overhearing a conversation between my parents, and my father was consoling my mother, who was really distraught and upset, um, because it, he said, you know, after she finishes school, we'll look for a bride womb, we'll get her married. And at that point, what I felt was an incredible sense of, of disappointment, um, that I was too much trouble. Um, I wouldn't be able to make it in the world. And I think something in me shifted at that point. I started writing and I wrote my first book, and suddenly it was a huge success, surprisingly, and it created a career path for me. My parents, my teachers, instead of seeing me as a failure, who was barely coping, were suddenly proud of my success. I won scholarships, I went abroad, I had foreign book tours, and I have a career that other people now consider successful. But the truth is that this skill, my writing, my ability to imagine is just a coping strategy. A coping strategy for a lonely child with no friends who did not know what exactly was wrong with her and somehow didn't feel like she was normal or she fitted in. What I had then, which no one diagnosed at that age, um, but I have learned since, um, was a learning disorder, an invisible disability, if some people say that, call that. Um, it's called dyspraxia, and it's a development coordination disorder. Uh, that's why, as a child, I was so clumsy, why I couldn't dress myself properly, why I couldn't do well at sports, and all of these things are indications of this. It also affects your verbal 
learning ability, which is why I had a hard time speaking, which is why I had a hard time learning languages and I couldn't speak until I was three or four. I st still struggle to learn languages. It still affects one's life. I have tried many times to learn a cycle. I can't drive a cycle, I can't drive a car, I can't seem to do those sorts of complex coordination things. Um, and it also often occurs along with ADHD, uh, which is why I used to disassociate in class, why I had attention difficulties and struggled in school. And one still has this to a certain extent. I've just learned how to manage it a lot better. And I'm not, you know, my parents and my teachers, need, none of them knew any better. They didn't have, at the time that I was growing up, they didn't have the ability, the knowledge on how to do things differently, on how to deal with a child like this. Also, uh, the fact that I, you know, I'm, I'm also somewhere on the spectrum. So I hope you understand from this why I feel uncomfortable with the idea of success and of calling people successful because I still struggle with and I struggle then with a lot of, a lot of things and I feel that in order to be successful, to seem successful, you have to deny this. This little girl who walks on eggshells and is scared of disappointing others, the one who doesn't have friends and desperately wants to be made friends with or to be chosen to be on the team and not for people to get worried or stressed about her. But I also don't want to forget her because it's her struggle, this little child that I was, that struggle that really makes me connect with others, particularly now that I'm a teacher and I work with students. When I see them, I, and I know that inside of them, there is that spark, that is their talent, there is something that is really deeply special in every child. What their parents or teachers or report cards may not see about them, but that's there. And I would like to change what, it, what that word means, what success means. I think the real power, the real success is accepting ourselves, accepting others, even the parts that don't fit in, because those are the parts that really have the capacity to change things. And I, I think when we see that, we see each other clearly, we can see that specialness then. And we really need that to come out. So for me, that is what success is. And that's what I really want to share with you um, that I, I feel like I've learned through my whole life. It isn't about awards or achievements or anything else. It's just the power to be yourself, to accept oneself and, all, and give other people the power by doing that for yourself to do that for themselves. And I think together, if we can do that, we can create a world where the really special bits of us can come out and do something new, do something different, do something that the world hasn't seen before. Thank you. Thank you.